Here's an unusual success story for you. Let me introduce you to Elizabeth Cochran Seaman, aka Nellie Bly, exposer of the horrors of a mental asylum in the late 1800s. I'm scared already. In 1885, Elizabeth read an article that argued that women should only have a domesticated role in the house, raising kids, cooking, and so forth. She wrote a sharp rebuke under the pseudonym Nellie Bly, earning her a spot as a columnist. Fun fact, she got her pen name from a song by Stephen Foster, who was basically the Justin Bieber of 1800s American folk music. Nellie became an investigative reporter, exposing unsafe working conditions, poor wages, and long hours at a local factory. Thank God all that's over with. <coughs> Amazon. <coughs> As an investigative reporter, she was given the terrifying assignment of looking into the Women's Lunatic Asylum on Blackwell's Island. You're welcome for the movie title, Hollywood. Her task was, quote, go undercover at the asylum with no guidance even on how to gain entry, never mind how to get out, unquote. Well, isn't that a whole big bag of nope? She pretended, as I often do, that she was from Cuba and was searching for missing non-existent trunks. Getting in, as you can imagine, was the easy part. Over 10 days, she documented spoiled food, abuse, obscene neglect, filthy living conditions, and the general hellscape of an asylum that was well on its way to becoming eternally haunted, no doubt. She wrote a book on it called 10 Days in a Madhouse, which is just 700 fewer days than most of us have spent in a madhouse during this pandemic so far. Nellie built a career sticking up for what she believed in when nobody else believed in and around her. So learn her lesson well, I say, and expose, expose. All right, welcome to our module on undercover reporting. And this has to do with exactly what has been happening before in the context of truth and what we should do as persons who are engaged in telling the truth at all times in the context of reporting and what we see here in not just the United States, but other networks across other com countries and other jurisdictions as it relates to undercover reporting. Now, issues of undercover reporting really are bordering on what should be done ethically and unethically in the context of reporting. And so by way of preamble, today's case study really deals with the ethics of undercover reporting, a technique involving the use of some level of deception in order to gather information for a new story. And we know that the Nellie Bly issue, Elizabeth Cochran really had no choice but to go in that direction. We know that the ethicists, they have said that we should not, the Society for Professional Journalists, they are against the types of deceptions that are related to telling people what is happening, but there was uh, no choice left in the mind of this particular undercover reporter who um, went into that asylum to expose atrocities that were existing at the time. I'd like to encourage you to also access the other undercover reporters on the module. It's here as a file in terms of their own work in exposing the excesses, whether it's corruption or whether it's something that has to do with human trafficking. It's all recorded here in terms of those stories. Now, the Society for a Professional Code of Ethics really speaks to discouraging undercover reporting, stating that journalists should avoid undercover or other surreptitious methods of gathering information, except when traditional methods, you know, will not be information vital to the public. So they're saying that use of such methods should be explained as part of the story. So it means that like Nellie Bly's story, she should say that there was no way I was going to get the people who were in the asylum to speak to me. Policymakers were silent. We weren't aware of what was happening inside there in terms of people going to see their loved ones. And so that's the reason why we went in there. She went in there to cover the stories. And so the Society for Professional Journalists, the code also reminds journalists to recognize that private people have a greater right to control information about themselves than do public officials and others who seek power, influence, or attention. And this goes to professionals who are in the realm of politics or whether they're actors or actresses, they cannot necessarily expect privacy as a private person. And so on the other hand, you know, undercover reporting has a cherished but controversial history in the American journalism fraternity or in their, um, I would say, culture. And so Nellie Bly was not the only person who would have been a part of that, but she certainly raised a lot of eyebrows back then in relation to what can actually happen if someone decides to take on the voice of the voiceless in the context of reporting on the conditions of those who were held in an asylum at that time. Now, undercover reporters have rooted out corruption. They've exposed dangerous working conditions, 
and they have shed light on social injustices globally, not just across the United States. If you're following Reporters Without Borders, you will see that many of them were able to um, wipe out and root out corruption happening in um, you know, corrupt regimes, those regimes that are quote unquote undemocratic. They have been really doing a lot of work in the context of what is happening um, fully um, in light of social injustices. So you will find that quite a few things have happened and occurred in the past to reveal um, you know, you know, what was happening in, in, in historically speaking and in contemporary times as well. Some of the most successful and famous examples of undercover journalism can be found here, like I said. You can go to Deep Well and you will find some examples here for you. Now, when it comes to ethicists Bob Steele, um, the Pointner Institute, they have developed a series of guidelines to help reporters determine whether the use of deception in reporting is and isn't appropriate. And so what the guideline says is that information obtained must be of vital public interest and that all other alternatives for obtaining the information must have already been exhausted. Meaning if the public official, if the sources that are internal to that story will not speak, then they should you know, be, ex you know, be told, whoever is actually looking at the story should be told that the person, the reporter has tried to speak with Tom, or Jane, and they have refused to actually state what the facts were. And so we've had to, as an establishment, resort to the types of, um, you know, conditions. We've had to resort to the types of mechanisms, the tactics that speak to undercover reporting that the Society for Professional Journalists are saying it's a no-no. We've had to do that in order to let the public know what was happening to their loved ones within the asylum. That's just a, a, an example that I'm bringing to you. Journalists must be willing to disclose how and why, if someone has gone in there as a staff member of that particular establishment that is really running a sweatshop, they should say that they posed as a worker for that factory. They should say that they posed as someone who wanted to be trafficked to actually disclose and to divulge how human trafficking is actually ebbing away at families uh, at a cross border, as a cross-border transaction. You know, so the, the list of that still provides it to be strict and it's designed to keep deceptive journalism tactics to a bare minimum. Let's look at some of that. So here's what they're saying. When the information update is of profound importance, then it's okay to actually do whatever you're doing in terms of the breaching of ethical practices. In other words, like I said, it must be of vital public interest, such as revealing something that is a, a great systemic failure at the top levels. Of course, it must prevent profound harm, profound harm, individuals who actually seen the story. Now, if there's a systemic failure that is happening that is affecting an entire community, let's say there is a lack of maintenance in terms of the waterways and an entire community suffers from um, drought or they suffer from some sort of a breach in the system that is resulting in poor potable water, that is resulting in some sort of, um, I would say, infection happening through the pipelines, um, you know, the water is contaminated, then there is a right of that particular individual to go in there and to see exactly what is happening in the engineering aspect of things. If there are broken mains, if there's a case where there's been no servicing happening for years, if there's a case where the engineers just sit around and there is system failure, then that person has a right to reveal so that the entire community of individuals who are affected or impacted can know up front that they should not be drinking that water continuously. All right. So preventing harm to individuals should be the goal when the information is of profound importance. And of course, when all other alternatives for obtaining the same information have been exhausted and when the journalists involved are willing to disclose the nature of the deception, such as a hidden camera in the conversation um, that is actually carried out among those engineers who are actually not necessarily doing what they're supposed to be doing. Or some con somebody in public office saying, well, just don't bother with those people. They're going to be fine anyhow um, because they're not necessarily important to us. That's very, very vital information here that should be disclosed so that people can know exactly where their taxpaying dollars are being used, much to the detriment of an entire community. Now, Steele's ethical guidelines goes on to say, the guidelines go on to say that when the individuals involved and their news organization apply excellence through understanding craftsmanship, as well as the commitment of time and funding needed 
pursue the story fully, meaning that they have got all sides. They have gotten my side, your side, and the other side. They have been able to tell the truth coming from policymakers as well as those persons at the community level. They have applied all of the tests in terms of verification of the facts. They have spent time, a month or two months on the ground investigating the story to pursue it fully, not just going there and observing for one hour and deciding that this is the fact. They've actually gone deeply into the issue. They've backgrounded the issue. They've provided context. And this is where the excellence is actually applicable in this particular um, perspective, as well as the ethical guidelines. So they must have done all of that to bring the story to the public domain. And the next point to note is that when the harm prevented by the information revealed through deception outweighs any harm caused by the act of deception. Again, if we were to go back to the example of letting the people know that the water is contaminated, if you're going to save an entire community um, rather than save one person who has not been managing the process well, then it's okay according to the ethical guidelines provided by point there. It is okay to save the whole and to make sure that one person takes the responsibility or five as against an entire community, including children who are at risk of actually being infected and affected. And when journalists involved have conducted a meaningful, collaborative and deliberative decision-making process on the ethical and legal guidelines, am I going to be you know, caught in a web of deceit? Am I going to be called over the coals for defamation? Am I li being libelous in any way? Am I causing slander? Am I actually weighing all sides of the legal and ethical issues? Am I breaching someone's privacy um, to actually get the information? Is it worth doing this? Um, it, what, what are the implications of, 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 of what I'm doing on the establishment or on my own personal life? All of these are what uh, we call a meaningful collaborative decision-making process on the ethical and legal issues pertaining to that coverage of the story. Now, on the cover, on the fire, this particular reading is a column in the LA Times by Ken Silverstein, and this is a journalist who had gone on the cover to disclose ways in which lobbyists and elected officials sometimes work together in unethical ways. As some of you may not know this, I'd like you to look at the video and you'll get a background into what has been transpiring in some instances, in some jurisdictions and countries where you would have found and you would have seen on the news that a particular administration has been toppled as a result of undemocratic practices. Not necessarily so. Um, you may not know this, but part of my background is international relations. And so from a global perspective, you'll find that some administrations have been taken out as a result of lobbyists, as a result of the power of working with very strong governments and those lobbyists who want to see that particular administration in that country. In most cases, it's a developing country taken out as a result of not necessarily working um, in the best interest of the lobby group, all right, not necessarily the people. I'm not saying this to say that there haven't been instances where, um, you know, administrations have done Hong, where there are people, where the citizens are concerned in terms of using weapons of mass destruction or chemical weapons. But there have been cases where administrations, governments have been taken out purely on the grounds of, of the lobbyists and the ways in which they have been able to get, you know, stronger countries, you know, Western powers to buy into the lines of the lobbyists in such a way that you will find them actually doing what Pointer um, actually would say is it's very 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 unethical all right so the undercover reporting of these particular unethical practices of elected and public officials it has really not necessarily taken off a whole lot but there are instances when it's when it really happened and so silverstein really uh, brings this to our attention and he lets us know that we need to make sure that we're not seeing things at face value when it comes to seeing an administration toppled and thinking well that's an undemocratic um, you know, administration, that was a very bad government. In some cases, like I said, not necessarily the truth when it comes to how uh, somebody is in power and who gets to remain in power and uh, who gets to leave the office. Now, to catch a predator, this has to do with the NBC Dateline news magazine show, which featured personnel from Dateline um, and police who collaborated to catch and videotape perpetrators or perps who have been lured into a sting operation. And if you Google, you will find that this show was discontinued because there was this notion of should journalists actually be engaged in working with the police? 
the men who were caught in the process were actually entrapped and publicly, publicly shamed. And so they have not actually been convicted, but they have been convicted in the public domain because if you have gotcha, um, some persons, critics felt that this was inappropriate because these were not people who actually did the act, but they were about to. And so there were hidden cameras. The cameras got there. The police were there. The journalists were there. And they're like, here is the next, here is the next pedophile. And so the public shaming and humiliation really crossed the line when it comes to are journalists supposed to, should journalists be doing this in the context of public shaming and humiliation? Is more harm being done to those persons when you're working with law enforcement? For those persons who are proponents argue that journalists are working to inform the public about the threat of sexual predators and to show how police work to capture perpetrators, right? So it is, you know, a sort of a mixed perspective, mixed views on whether journalism should get into that particular crime fighting mechanism of exposure or whether they should just let the public know what to look out for and not take their cameras with the police officers. Now, there's some implications that, some, some, that today's readings bring up, and this has a lot to do with undercover reporting in general, and of course, the sensational sting type operations used by the To Catch a Predator and advocacy groups such as PervertedJustice.com. Some questions I'd like for you to think about is what do journalists, you know, the ethical codes and ethics experts say about these types of things? What do, you know, what, what role do ratings play in when it is we're, you know, engaged in sting operations and journalists are engaged in sting operations? Uh, as a result of the high ratings, do you think that this should really stimulate the practices of a journalist when it comes to exposing people? who are engaged in predatory activities or were about to engage in predatory activities. And of course, to what extent should the reporter work with law enforcement um, officers in exposing people? Now, the discussion questions, these are questions that you will actually be discussing with yourself as you consider, or feel free to reach out to someone. You're not necessarily posting anything, but these are questions for you to think about as you think through the implications of today's readings that are assigned, and of course, this whole notion of undercover reporting and the ethical nature of undercover reporting, starting from Nellie Bly, going right down to what is happening in today's society in terms of the access to public officials, the right, the need, and the want of the public to know what is happening. And of course, those larger issues of, of the press and the responsibility to actually let the public know when something is actually of impact to their lived experiences or their personal lives. So I will stop right here.